Thank you. Well, um, good afternoon to all, and thank you for the effort that you've all made uh, in coming here. <clears throat> I think I've printed out the wrong wedding speech, actually. <laughs> Uh, no, it's uh, Tom and Brian who's working for <laughs> So I'll just up and rise. Um, so I'll start again. Good afternoon and welcome to Georgie and Richard's wedding. It is a pleasure to see that so many people have made uh, the long trip to the lovely county of Cornwall. And we feel honoured that Georgie's recollections of family holidays camping in the area were sufficiently positive to make her wish to get married here. Obviously, the traumatic hair-washing memory where she screamed Trella Warren down, leading to concerned campers ringing in the police have faded. Uh, just joking, actually. I didn't quite get that far. <laughs> Though I almost did one morning when we couldn't find her. Um, much panic ensued. She was only about two at the time um, until we discovered her suspended hammock-like off the end of the trailer tent. <laughs> She was very, very, uh, quite happy about it, actually. She was still snoozing away. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, so, however, Bev and I, together with Jeff and Don, are um, absolutely thrilled to see you here. But I wouldn't be, uh, be doing my job if I didn't reminisce in a rather embarrassing daddy kind of way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I suppose I better get that over with, Georgie. Um, Georgina Alice Alexandria first saw the light of day one damp November morning. When she was born, she had a shock of straight black hair, which she spent many hours and much effort trying to maintain. <laughs> she also had a bit of a temper when things didn't quite go her way. <laughs> On her first trip to Cornwall, we stopped at a, a campsite and there were some out outdoor tables there, which Georgie absolutely loved. And she made us promise that uh, we'd get one when we got home. So off we went to, um, you know, sort of home base, got the flat pack, bunged it together, put it out in the garden, and Georgie was looking forward to having her breakfast in it the next morning. Next morning it was absolutely pissing down. <laughs> so I was rather reluctant to soggify my cornflakes and myself outside, but as uh, Georgie had no such reservations, and threamed and threamed and threamed until we made a token visit to the table. So um, she also, at that stage in life, had a bit of a, a lisp. And once when uh, discussing her padders, which were sort of toddler shoes, as some of you will know, confided to Nanny here that uh, Daddy calls them flippers, but I call them flippers. <laughs> she was also very small, <laughs> fond of smarties. Which often, which often cause much consternation and then amusement. But uh, she, <laughs> the other thing that she loved doing when she was young was she loved playing at ghosts and monsters with uh, her big sister Bryony. And um, she, uh, she dressed up for the occasion usually by wearing a flat cap, you know, a la Peaky Brinders, and a, uh, a blanket. So Georgie, uh, to reminisce, I've actually got the flat cap, which you can now keep. <laughs> but um, she, had, uh, she had also developed some very interesting ideas and observations on life. And uh, Mrs. Amby, who was her first teacher, told us she'd always been going home and recounting to Henry, who I presume is her husband, um, little George's latest pearl of wisdom. For example, uh, when we went across to, to France, we booked in the channel, and she was seriously concerned and shared that concern with Mrs. Emby as to whether she would see the fish when, when she went through the tunnel. <laughs> and then later on, when we went on the ferry instead, she, she was really, really worried about whether the ferry was going to smell fishy. <laughs> But, uh, however, she lost the preoccupation in Vietnam when uh, fish soup was a standard breakfast, which uh, was not something that Georgie was terribly entranced with. So we ended up sending food parcels of proper breakfast cereals uh, over to, to Vietnam for her. But uh, Georgie very early developed uh, a real interest in books, 
And uh, at a quite young age, at the age of nine, she read The Lord of the Rings. And she would uh, discuss that at home with us and uh, the deeper meaning of it all and we talked to our teacher about it. And um, later on, when we had the boat, she would sit downstairs, no ma- reading, no matter what the weather conditions were, it would be blown a, an absolute hooly outside, the boat would be bouncing about all over the place and Georgie would be sitting in the corner downstairs reading a book, which is absolutely amazing really. So it really was no shock then that she actually ended up studying English literature at university. Uh, That that ended actually in a flood of tears because um, she she phoned us up after she got the result in a real state actually, crying. They've got it wrong. (laughs) It turned out that she'd done really well and was worried that the mark was incorrect, (laughs) Uh, which it wasn't actually. But uh, as well as that, uh, slightly earlier on at school, uh, she was an early adopter of the internet. And uh, we as parents, Bev and I, get really worried about this actually because uh, of the amount of time that she was spending on there and we didn't know what she was doing and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, because we didn't really understand the internet either, we still don't. So we, uh, so we rationed Georgie by restricting her access by uh, you know, sort of keeping her Wi-Fi card off her. So we would take her Wi-Fi card off her and say, you can, you can have your Wi-Fi card for half an hour or something like that. And um, now that she's a bit older, now I'm married in Mrs. Fields, we've decided to give her her Wi-Fi card back. So you're in the Georgia. Yeah, that's right. We now see Georgie as a, a really poised, professional, confident young lady. We're really, really proud of her experience and what she's achieved academically, professionally, personally, in her, and after university with her travelling and work experiences. Although she still does worry a little bit about maintaining her straight care. <laughs> um, and now to the groom. I'd like to welcome... Richard to the family. Uh, I suppose it's a bit late, really. Has been, he's been a bit part of the family for a few years now. So I'll just bring up a few embarrassing incidents. <laughs> like, um, but uh, there's, some, uh, there's some very positive embarrassing incidents. Like the, the time we all went to run the, the Peckham 10K, but I sort of misjudged the traffic a bit. And uh, we were a bit late. Uh, Richard was already there, but he very gallantly sacrificed his race and guided Bev and Bryony to a uh, fast, personal best. <laughs> but um, he's also a very keen sportsman and musician and can be amazingly persistent at times, especially when rock climbing, spending hours trying to resolve a single move <laughs> off the ground. <laughs> Now, um, apparently, as I'm the elder speaker at this wedding, I should uh, impart some of my wisdom to the uh, assembly here. or No, not to the assembly, actually, to the happy couple. I think I got that one wrong, didn't I? <laughs> About maintaining a happy, healthy and happy marriage and living a happy life. That's really uh, a bit tricky, as wisdom has never really been my 40 <laughs> or 30. But, uh, however, I can do worse than quote my dad's advice. Never let the sun go down your wrath. To which I'll add a little bit of advice to Richard. Always put the toilet seat up when you pee. (laughs) Now, um, could you please be upstanding now as I propose an old Scottish toast to the bride and groom? May you be poor in misfortune, rich in blessings, slow to make enemies, quick to make friends, but rich or poor, quick or slow, may you know nothing but happiness from this day forward. Thank you. Thank you. And over to Richard. Um, Okay. uh, Thank you, Jim, for your kind words. And I completely agree with all the nice things you just said about me. And I really don't want you to see today as losing a daughter, but as more of gaining a son. And let's face it, with three daughters and a son-in-law like Tom, it was about time a a young masculine man joined the family. Um, 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Richard, the groom, just in case you didn't know. Um, now, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes um, of your time to say a few words before I spend the next 40 years or so listening. Um, <laughs> now, before I do get properly started, there will be a few toasts, so do make sure your glasses are full and a bottle is near. Um, so, firstly, on behalf of my wife and I... <laughs> welcome. I mean, t today we're surrounded by our closest family and friends, and all of you, well, some of you, have been quite important to us throughout our time together. Um, and we're really happy that you're with us today. Um, today is very much the happiest day of our life, and, um, and it will be a date that we celebrate every single year moving forward. Um, and when we decided to get married in Cornwall on a Wednesday, we realised the effort that you'd all have to make to get here today. It's quite a trek for everyone. Um, so we'd just like to thank you all for just making that, such an effort to, to join us today. And if you decided to make a few days of it, then hope you enjoy the rest of your time down in this beautiful part of the country. Um, now, although a lot of you have travelled quite some distance to be here today, there are a few special mentions. Um, so there's the family from Scotland. Thank you very much for travelling all the way down south. Give it up for Scotland. Um, there's Ema and Gary who have travelled from Belfast. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Pete's travelled from Amsterdam. <laughs> Aye. Easy now. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. Um, James and Fiona have come over from Sweden. Val <laughs> Comet. <laughs> Serena, all the way from Dubai. That's international. And Joel from whatever planet you're from. That's right. um, now, we hope you've all enjoyed the day so far and um, just let your hair down this evening, have a good time. Um, and for all the children in the room, there might be a cash prize for the best dancer later. Um, but, but Stu, aka Disco Stu, this competition is just for children, it's not for adults. Um, now, unfortunately, as with all occasions such as this, there's certain people that can't be with us today for um, obvious reasons. So I just wanted to mention um, Alan, Fred, Sally, Mitch, James and Winnie. Um, they all played an important role in either mine or Georgie's lives um, and they're very much in our thoughts today. Um, so I'd appreciate if we all stood and raise a toast to absent family and friends. Absent family and friends. <clears throat> thank you. We love you, Rich. Oh, thanks, Vince. Um, Be Bev and Jim, um, thank you for raising Georgie to be the caring, intelligent, and beautiful person that she is today. Um, <laughs> And, and as I've already said, um, you've now gained another son-in-law. However, you're not mum and dad number two. Because uh, anyone that knows Georgie and our sisters, you are mummy and daddy. <laughs> so, mummy, daddy, <laughs> thank you for welcoming me into your family. Um, and thanks also for inspiring us with your love of Cornwall. Um, people often ask Georgie and I why we decided to get married in Cornwall, and we tend to make up a different answer each time, just for lols. Um, <laughs> but I, I know all your trips down here throughout um, Georgie's childhood have given us such happy memories of this part of, um, of the country, and so thank you for inspiring us. Um, you've been so supportive of uh, everything Georgie and I have done, from when we went to go and work overseas to when we returned and putting a roof over our heads. Um, and Jim, another rock climbing story. Um, thanks so much for bringing all your rock climbing stuff when you visited us in Spain. Uh, by surprise. Uh, I really enjoyed climbing that really steep cliff face in the blistering heat with no climbing experience. Um, but seriously, thank you for everything. Um, Abs and yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, this brings me on to my mum and dad. And uh, without you two, I quite literally wouldn't be here today. Um, <laughs> let's not get into that now. <laughs> um, 
as the middle child of three, I'm sure you're worried that I was neglected, ne neglected in some way um, or wasn't paid as much attention as Paul or Michelle. Uh, so I just want to let you know that if you feel any guilt inside, then that can just be soothed with cash. Um, just bear that in mind, yeah? Um, but in all honesty, I really hit the jackpot when it came to parents. Um, Mum, your kindness and positive outlook on life is amazing and contagious. And I really hope some of that's rubbed off on me. Um, whereas Dad, you literally built our childhood home with your bare hands. Um, a fact that gave you legendary status amongst a lot of my school friends, uh, which still remains to this day. Um, it's probably fair to say those handyman skills have skipped a generation. Um, and thanks again for driving the 100 mile round trip to mine and George's house last month to put up some coat hooks. And that's a true story, seriously true story. Um, <laughs> I'm so grateful for how you've both welcomed Georgie into the family. I know you've made her feel welcome right from the, be the beginning of our relationship and I know she's very happy to now officially be a field. Um, we've got both sets of parents a gift, um, so Michelle, can you just do the honours? Uh, and whilst Michelle's doing that, I'd just like to say it's a moment to raise a toast to parents. To parents. You can, yeah. Chop, chop. <laughs> You're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, um, so, yeah, you're welcome, both of you. Um, a big thank you to everyone who made today um, possible. So, Lara, Matt, and the whole team here at Launceville's Barton, thank you so much uh, for letting us have our wedding day here. Um, As soon as we laid eyes on this venue, we were completely sold. Uh, so we're really proud and happy to have our day here. Um, to our caterers, Pickle Shack, I hope you agree the food was pretty, pretty good this afternoon. Um, hopefully I'll be able to stomach that brownie later. I couldn't put it there. Um, to our photographers and videographers just here looking at me right now. Thanks, guys. Um, and to all the incredible suppliers, the magician earlier, who I think went down pretty well. Um, the hair, makeup, etc., 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 etc. A few special mentions. So, um, Bryony, Georgie's older sister and maid of honour, um, thank you for so many things. I think um, for decorating the, uh, the cake, all the cross stitch signs, organising the hen do. The new, there's more, there's more, hold your applause. Um, the numerous shopping trips with Georgie and my credit card. Uh, being on the end of countless FaceTime calls, Georgie feels and I agree that we couldn't have organized today without your help. Um, so thank you for everything. And we've got you a little gift to say thank you as well. Um, just a few more thanks. Um, Dad, thank you for doing the really masculine job of making the wooden sides, signs outside the venue and the wooden easels with your bare hands. Thank you. Um, Tom, thanks for doing all the girly, pretty handwriting on the chalkboards. <laughs> Didn't realise you had that in your locker. Um, Mum, Mummy, Michelle, thanks for your help with the wedding favours. Thank you. Um, and thanks to anyone else who I may have missed um, that has helped us with today. Um, but Georgie, ultimately this day is all down to you. Um, you've put in so much effort, all the evenings of wedmin, it's a brand new word in my vocabulary. Um, you've worked so hard in making today possible uh, and making today a success. You've organised things that I would never have even considered or even thought about. Um, I've also had a big say in today. I suggested hundreds of things to Georgie uh, before she dismissed every single one of them. Um, <laughs> um, to my ushers, uh, today I've seen some fantastic examples of ushering. Uh, some of the best ushering I've seen in quite some time. Textbook ushering, some would say. Um, but in all seriousness, I genuinely have no idea what you guys have done today. So, thank you for showing people where the toilets are, I don't know. Um,
But no, seriously, guys, you've helped a lot. Thank you. And I, I mean, we couldn't have done, done it today without you guys. I probably could, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, to Paul, my best man and brother, uh, thank you for your help and support being best man. Um, and thank you for playing the piano so perfectly during the ceremony. I mean, I think everyone will agree that Paul is quite a pianist. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you for organising the stag do in Liverpool, in which I believe you effectively bankrupted half of my friends. Am I right? Um, all, all the guys on the stag that were shortchanged, go and see Paul after the speeches, and he'll buy you a drink at the bar. Um, but, but in all honesty, thank you for the relaxing, detoxing, and cultural trip to Liverpool. To all the bridesmaids, uh, Bryony, Michelle, Faye, um, you all look absolutely stunning today. Um, thank you for all your help. Um, I've already mentioned how supportive you've been, Bryony. Um, Faye, I just want to say a special thank you for drawing the picture on the back of the newspaper. Yeah. Quite the artist. And uh, Michelle, thanks for coming. <laughs> I'm only, I'm only um, Thanks for supporting Georgie every step of the way as well. I know you helped out with the Hindu a bit as well. Uh, and for your reading during, during the ceremony, thank you. Um, so now I come on to the most important person in my life, um, my beautiful wife, Georgie. Yeah. Now, I first met Georgie in Goldfinger's nightclub in Salisbury. Um, Goldfinger's nightclub's no longer with us. Um, <laughs> She, she was clearly the prettiest girl in the club, and I, I can still see her there now, in the middle of the dance floor, just passed out on the floor. <laughs> she wasn't really. Um, we, we hit it off straight away, and I could instantly tell uh, that she was well-educated, uh, a characteristic often lacking in Salisbury's number two nightclub. Um, uh, I thought I'd impress Georgie by talking about books, trying to be a bit highbrow, then she told me she had a degree in English literature, so I thought I should probably start talking about something I already knew about, like football or something. Um, we've had quite an adventure from teaching overseas in Vietnam and Spain uh, to starting new careers, buying a house, raising our first child, Magda. Um, yeah. Thank you. Magda can't be with us today. She's hanging out with her cousin Audrey at the beach. Um, I can't wait to start the next chapter of our lives together. Um, just to let you know, I first realised I loved Georgie when we were living in a cockroach-ridden bedsit in Vietnam. That's quite romantic. Um, Georgie had noticed that a lot of women in Vietnam seem to be suffering from premature hair loss, some even going fully bold. Um, so Georgie did some investigation. She went online and found studies suggesting that female hair loss in Vietnam was related to the US chemical weapon Agent Orange still in the water supply from the Vietnam War. True story. So for the next four months, I washed Georgie's hair with mineral water every single day. And if that's not true love, I don't know what it is. Georgie, not only are you beautiful, um, but you're the most caring and loving person I know, and you make me smile every day. Um, you've also made me a better person, helping me appreciate more the importance of family, of friendship, and love. Uh, we've had a fantastic journey, um, from that cockroach-ridden bedsit to drinking champagne overlooking New York City. Um, we've visited loads of places along the way, making great memories, and I can't wait to make loads more with you. Um, you're my everything, and I love you. So, I'd just like to raise one final toast to Georgie. Woo! Um, <laughs> so, as, as this speech draws to a close, and before I pass you on to my, uh, my brother Paul, I'd just like to say the following. Um, is Paul closing? Okay, yeah, cool. Um, Paul, if you didn't know, was in a few bands in his youth. 
Uh, he actually had a record deal at one stage um, and a music video. He sold tens of albums. Um, <laughs> However, all that partying and fame takes its toll, and sometimes Paul gets his wires crossed uh, and generally struggles with the concept of fact and fiction. So just bear that in mind during his speech. Um, <laughs> enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone, and please give a warm welcome to my brother who's lost his voice a little bit, uh, Paul. Okay, right, here we go. So I, I, I do really apologise for the voice. It's some sort of cruel irony that uh, on the day that uh, I lose my voice is also the day that I'm speaking in front of my brother, and my voice is the best tool I have for embarrassing him. So, uh, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So, as Richard said, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Paul, I'm Richard's best man, I'm also his older brother. Um, it really is a true privilege to be Richard's best man. But if I'm honest, I didn't ever expect this actually to happen. And there's a, there's a very precise reason why I thought this would never happen. Um, and I've never told Richard about this. So uh, a few years ago, this is before, this is after Richard had met Georgie, but before he'd asked her to marry him, Richard and I were discussing the concept of best men. And I'd said how I thought having your brother as your best man was a bit of a cop-out and just generally quite lame. <laughs> and this is one of those comments that usually gets consigned to the dustbin of things you've said over the years, never to be remembered ever again. And I'd forgotten about it um, until the day Richard told me he'd asked Georgie to marry him and she'd said yes. And along with all the pleasure that, that associates that message, my mind was just filled with you idiot, why did you say that? Because I think he wants to ask me to be his best man, and I've told him that he'd be a bit of an idiot for doing that. Um, so when Richard did ask me, I said yes, um, because of course I'm gonna say yes. Um, it's a true privilege to be your best man. But, but, but. <laughs> Being a best man is kind of a bit of a double-edged sword, because it's the sort of thing that you want to do, but you also don't really want to do. And I've tried to, because of, so for example, this morning at 9am I was ironing Richard's shirt for him. I didn't sign up for that. Um, Do a good job. Thank you. Um, and I tried to think of an analogy to describe what it's like to be a best man. And against the advice of my wonderful partner Victoria here, I've come up with the following. <clears throat> so, being a best man, it's a bit like being offered sex with the Queen. <laughs> It's a true honour, <laughs> and there's no way any right-thinking person would say no. But once you begin the project, and you start to become presented with the true realities of it, you wish you maybe hadn't said yes quite so quickly. <laughs> and anyway, it's rude to pull out once you've started. So, um, Sorry, okay, right. Um, onwards and upwards. So I'd like to thank um, Richard again for asking me to be his best man. I'd like to thank everyone here for attending today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone that came on Richard's stag do, and we can talk about settling up later if, uh, if we have to. Um, but I'd actually like to thank Bryony for organising uh, Georgie's Hendu in London. Uh, and from the sounds of it, you had lots of fun. There was, it was wholesome fun. There was uh, escape rooms, which I know Georgie loves. There was a bottomless brunch. And there was dancing and karaoke. So all the things we know that Georgie likes. Slightly more under the radar, though, was Georgie's other Hindu. <laughs> wherein Georgie took her mother Bev, her sisters, and my mother and my sister to, of all places, Amsterdam. <laughs> now, of course, we don't know what truly happened in Amsterdam, but I've heard a few whispers, whispers and from just those few details, it makes Richard Stag do sound like a three-day yoga retreat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't speak about Georgie. Um, I remember the first time Richard introduced me to Georgie. I'm very glad that Jim spoke about Georgie's love for books. Um, so when I first met Georgie, I was very surprised. And I don't want to give the impression that I have a low expectations of the sort of people my brother chooses to associate with. <laughs> but I was surprised by Georgie, in particular, her, her, uh, how affable she is, how engaging she is, how sociable, and finally, how intelligent she is. And it was that final point, Georgie's intelligence, that uh, sparked with Richard as well. Because before Georgie came round to Richard's place for the first time, and by Richard's place, I obviously mean his parents' house. <laughs> Richard asked if he could borrow some things from me. I'm so pleased that you don't remember this. Richard asked to borrow some of my more intellectual sounding books that he could leave scattered around the room as if he'd been reading them. Uh, so Georgie, if you remember seeing The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx, or Ham on Rye by Charles Bukowski, or what was the other one, Being a Nothingness by Jean-Paul Sartre? Those were mine. Now, I don't want to give the impression that Richard's not a big reader. He is a big reader. And I'm sure that my books um, impressed Georgie just as much as uh, World Cup heroes wrote World Cup 1998. Um, but clearly it was enough. Uh, those books and Richard's books as well was enough to convince Georgie to continue a relationship with him that ended up in uh, this happening today. And I'm really glad this is the case. Because Georgie truly has transformed our family. In a, in a, and I mean that honestly. Um, whether it's in terms of the bespoke quizzes and games you make for our family get-togethers. So previously, our family get-togethers would culminate in my mother and father falling asleep at 4 p.m. Now they culminate in genuine... Yeah, it's true, isn't it? <laughs> now they culminate in wholesome fun. Uh, secondly, I think you've made us more connected as a family. So if I think to our family WhatsApp or the, the fun we've had on holiday, last year was my father's 70th birthday. We went to Cyprus and at the last minute the accommodation uh, cancelled on us and we were genuinely stuck and Georgie found us a better, if slightly more expensive, <laughs> villa for us to stay in at the last minute. So thank you very much for that. Um, now, on to my brother. It's tradition, it's tradition to, to roast the groom for somewhere between five and six minutes in a best man speech. Um, but actually it's quite hard to do that for someone like Richard, because Richard is genuinely a very decent person. Um, and it's, it's an honor to be his brother. And as the older brother, I'm the person that should set an example for him and I'm someone that he should look up to. But Genuinely, since we've been uh, adults, it's been the other way around. I feel like you're the person that set an example to me and I've looked up to you the whole time. So it makes it hard to, to roast you. <laughs> However, tradition is tradition, so I'm going to um, <laughs> just speak a little bit about Richard and I. So I've known Richard for almost 35 years. When I first met him, I didn't like him at all. <laughs> the communication was very, very poor, and he hogged all of my parents' attention. There's something about being the oldest child, there's something about having, going from having all of the attention to suddenly having, as far as I'm concerned, significantly less than half the attention that can grate on you. So I think that's part of the reason why we didn't sometimes always get on as kids. But actually the main reason, I think, is that we were quite we were opposites in many ways. Um, so for example, our parents could never get me to leave the house, yet they couldn't get Richard to stay at home. He'd always, sometimes, he'd always leave the house, uh, quite often not going to the place he said he would. And I'm not saying Richard ever had a problem with alcohol per se, but my father had to perfect the method of picking him up by his jeans when he was too drunk to walk home. And this is the reason why we really could have used you on the first night of the stag do, actually. Um, <clears throat> I was passionate about music as a child, and Richard was passionate about sport, although we did support each other. I would go and watch you play football, and you'd come and watch me play music. And you also gave music a go as well. 
if by giving music a go you mean having a drum kit sat in your room, unplayed, gathering dust for 15 years. <laughs> and finally on our differences, my parents struggled ever to get me to eat anything. I was a very poor eater when I was young. Richard, however, would eat anything. And from the moment he learned to speak until he was maybe seven or eight, every year for Christmas, he would ask for roast beef. And Richard's love of eating things actually went beyond what most of us would even consider food. I, I recall this one experience when um, I, Richard was maybe one or two, and I was maybe three or four, and mum was making sandwiches in the kitchen. Richard and I were playing in the living room. And I went through to the kitchen and said, Mum, I'd like some chocolate. And mum said, you can't have any chocolate until you've eaten your sandwiches. And I said, well, Richard's got some chocolate. And mum thought, Richard doesn't have any chocolate. And the sight that greeted mum when she went back into the living room and found Richard, now without his nappy on, I think will haunt her for the rest of her life. No worries. Um, but we were similar, we were similar. Um, our academic performance at school was almost identical. The maths teacher at Upper Raven School, I believe he was Mr. Edwards, once told mum at a parents' evening that the only student she taught that was a greater underachiever than Richard was his older brother. <laughs> so we have that in common. Um, okay, so I'd like to conclude by giving some advice on marriage. Um, but I... I this is not something I have any experience of. I'm in no position whatsoever to give any advice on marriage. So, I'll just take a glass of water, sip of water. So I would like to uh, finish with a quote on marriage. And this quote is from the big man, the king of kings, the guiding light. Someone who uh, our parents introduced Richard and I to at a very, very young age, and who has guided us spiritually and morally ever since. I'm talking, of course, about Homer Simpson. Um, so Homer Simpson said this, uh, some people will tell you that love and marriage are hopeless, but they're not hopeless. You don't have to be an expert on the subject to affect it. You just have to get it right once. So clearly the two of you have got it right, and you're both extremely lucky to have found each other. You are a very unique uh, couple, and you're clearly perfectly suited. And I can't wait to see what the future holds for you. So would you please all stand and raise your glasses to Mr. and Mrs. Fields. Mr. and Mrs. Fields. Oh my God. Thank you so much. Oh wow, we're pretty close.